I'm so thankful to this radical book they call Thousand and One Nights. Thousand and One Nights, it's international. It's for everyone. We don't even know the language of the book. We don't know who the author is. And this is like a very beautiful thing, you know, and that we don't have uh, now the luxury because people want to be credited. People want to be in the limelight, want to be known, you know, want to be sexy everywhere. But Thousand and One Nights, all the credit goes to the character. You know, she didn't want to die. Shahrazad did not want to die. She, she was clinging so much to life and she loved life. And then she came up, she said to herself, the only way to save myself is to tell stories, you know, to recount stories. And that's the power of recounting stories. Also writing saved my own life. I would never be talking to you right now, making this video, if it wasn't for my life because I had a chance to share my story, to tell my story, to offer a parallel narrative to the list. If, it, if your enemy tells your story, you're very much screwed up. You should always tell your own story, you know? especially in our world now, you know, that world is divided, you know, between rich and poor, the have and the have not. It's power for the less privileged to tell their story and to share their story with the world is so important. Otherwise, they will die. Thousand and One Night saved the life of Shahrazad. My Guantanamo diary, I do believe, saved my life. So we need to be like Shahrazad. We need to save our life in my part of the world and tell our story and keep people engaged, just like Shahrazad did to the king, the king that uh, symbolizes the power, you know, the power, the, the biggest power, the most powerful countries in the world. And, and we need to keep like the people in those very powerful countries engaged and understanding, keep very much entertaining them, at least entertaining them so they don't kill us. Because we just want to live. Hi, Larry. Hi, Bhakti. How are you? I'm good. Uh, so I think we're waiting on Mohamedou. We don't know where he is, but hopefully he's not having internet trouble. But welcome. And uh, we are going to talk about a book that was just published that we have loved called The Actual True Story of Ahmed and Zarga by Mohamedou Slahi with Larry Sims. So while we're waiting for him, we can... Uh, I can start by asking you a little bit about the the width part. Uh, how have what was the writing process of this book? Uh, was it ready, and then you sort of edited it? How did it um, how did it all come together? Uh, what a great question! I hope um, I hope you can hear me. My, it looks like my connection's a little bit spotty, so if it is, I may have to drop off and join again with my phone. But um, Anyway, thank you so much for doing this. So um, Mohamedou wrote a draft of Ahmed and Zarga when he was in Guantanamo. It was one of, I think, five or six manuscripts that he wrote besides Guantanamo Diary. Wow. Um, it's one of the, uh, one of the only one other than Guantanamo Diary that we're fortunate enough to have the, the version that he wrote in Guantanamo because he, like Guantanamo Diary, had sent that to his lawyers and they were able to get um, get that 
through the privilege process and cleared for release. So they they had sent me pages for Ahmed and Zarga while Mohamedou was still in prison. Um, and it's, you know, in, in shape and in structure, it's very much, you know, the book that we have now. Um, and when Mohamedou got out and we met and was talking about projects that we'd like to dive into, um, you know, this was the top of the list. And so essentially it was a process where, you know, Mohamedou took that material that he drafted in Guantanamo um, and and began to sort of fill it out um, into a novel length. I think it was more like a story length um, in the Guantanamo version. And so he filled it out and he would send me pages um, and I would generally just ask questions, um, you know, and say, this is beautiful and, you know, more of this and, or, you know, <laughs> um, what's happening here? I don't understand this or, um, and we had a conversation that went on for about, I don't know, Mohammed, what, how long, four or five months maybe, um, where, you know, just this, 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 um, the bread was baking, you know, um, you know, then the story was, was rising and, and, um, and becoming more and more done. And we would just go back and forth. Um, uh, and I think we went through the whole thing from beginning to end, you know, we would go through bit by bit and then beginning to end another four or five times, just kind of, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, shaping and, and refining these things. And then finally we had a wonderful editor at the University of Ohio Press who, um, who came in then with, you know, fresh eyes and went through again and said, you know, I don't understand this or, you know, tell me more about this. And mm -hmm. so um, we went through it again one or two more times. But it was, you know, a beautiful um, collaboration in some sense that was, I think, driven by and guided by, um, you know, just the the intensity and the clarity of Mohamedou's imagination um, and the and the um, the beautiful timeless kind of mythic space in which the story existed. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, um, I, I'm a poet by training. I studied classical literature in, at the university and, you know, and sort of the, the Homeric oral tradition um, has always been, you know, extremely fascinating to me. And this book from the first time I read the manuscript you know, clearly located itself in kind of this space of timeless storytelling um, and oral storytelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it was, it, it just sort of uh, that, and like I say, Mohammedu's vision of the story just kind of guided the way the process mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. Thank you. Mohamedou, uh, welcome. Sorry, we started without you because uh, we were waiting for you to settle in. Congratulations on this fantastic book that uh, it's being launched, live streamed all over on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Please follow at uh, Project Polis to uh, at the Polis Project if you want to watch this show. Uh, this is your second published work, and I was I had started by asking Larry what it means when his name appears right on top and it says with Larry Sims. And I asked him a little bit about uh, the process. Uh, so do you wanna do you wanna also comment a little bit on that? How is it to work with, uh, how was it to work together? What does it mean to kind of co-write a book? I know for a fact that uh, Larry probably doesn't know as much about camels and so on or the <laughs> desert. So I'm certain that it's entirely your imagination. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we were curious. People were curious how this book was written. And why, yeah. is, what, what's the, you know, the double credit. You know, Bhakti, thank you for having us. And it feels so good to have a professional writer and professional poet writing my book and I take credit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it's, I don't really know, like, I, I felt a little bit uneasy because like you have like to have really, you know, I think our both our names needs to be the same way written, you know, on the book. 
And I never told Larry this, but I always feel that way. And so I just want to tell you how this is done. So, you know, I, I love to write, but I really need always, there is always this problem that without formal training, there are very like, I guess, rookie mistake that, you know, I make. I didn't know when to end the paragraph, when to start the paragraph. And I don't think that write like, you know, like on nights or any other, you know, of the year. Islamic and, and, uh, and Andalusian writer knew when to start. They just know when the story starts and when it ends. That's all they know. And anything else is like very much uh, arbitrary, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but now we have the science of writing that I, I know nothing about. And then I always likened myself to a driver who is bad. First is bad driver, and then they don't know where they're going. So they just keep driving. And it's like uh, Larry is the GPS, you know, without like guiding me through. And it's also like, you know, the, the talking, you know, the good guy talking in my head. And we had like some uh, back and forth sometime. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometime, most of the time we, we both see the point of Larry and then we incorporate it. Some very few times I said no, you know, because Larry has uh, also his trained as a journalist. And journalists mm -hmm. wants to know like the, uh, very clearly, they want to know what went on. But to, in my mind, a story, you need to leave some mystery because this is not a piece of news. And I want that mystery to remain because in my mind, we don't need to have answer for everything. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. Some kind of mystery. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, would have been probably very different uh, in terms of the memoir, which was a kind of finished product, and then this one, which is more of a, uh, you know, giving him bits and pieces of, uh, of, of stuff as it gets, uh, as it gets formed. Um, you know, what about sort of how did you, Larry, kind of work through, um, you know, things like passages from the Quran? Was that something you all worked on together? Or was it entirely Muhammadu? Or like, what were, were there arguments about inclusion, including certain things, deleting certain things? Were there fights? Good fights. <laughs> I don't. I don't remember f any fights at all. And and I think, first of all, I just want to uh, react a little bit to what Mohammedu said. You know, I think um, for knowing what they're doing um, and for there being some secrets of the craft, I always um, think of, I think E.L. Doctorow described writing a novel I think we lost you for a second there. Larry? Mamadou, can you hear him? No. Oh, there you're back. I will try to switch networks. OK. Uh, we can hear you now. So you can, can you hear me now? I, I was yeah. saying uh, uh, E.L. Doctorow described writing as um, driving at night in the fog. Uh, writing a novel is like driving at night in the fog. And he said, you can only see as far as your headlights, you know, but somehow, mm -hmm. somehow you get to where you're going in the end. You know, you don't know where you're going. You can just see that far, but you make it that next distance and that next distance, and then you're, then you're home. So, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, I think writers are always, you know, uh, are always unsure of what the rules are and, and where the road is and everything. Um, I think, you know, I, I would say that the, the big thing that I've learned in working with both Guantanamo Diary and Ahmed and Zarga is that editors are almost always wrong. Um, and, you know, and so I think 
I think I'm I think any writer benefits from somebody who asks questions, mm -hmm. you know, who says, Oh, I want to hear more about this. This is interesting. You know, um, I really th this this really captures my imagination. That's very helpful to a writer. Um, but I think um I know in, in in Guantanamo Diary, I spent about six months, you know, working because I couldn't speak with Mohammedu then. So trying to edit the manuscript, I spent about six months editing the manuscript, and then about three months unediting things that I had done that weren't necessary. You know, learning more and more how, as Mohammedu says, you know, where to leave the mystery, where to mm -hmm. you know where the spaces are. Where the intention, how intentional that is, how intentional, you know, uh, how complicated the structure that Mohamedou, who pretends he doesn't know anything about writing. Hey, Larry has terrible connection. Describes a scene. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks so much. Mohamedou, do you want to, uh, uh, do you have any comment for Larry before he leaves us? I had asked him to join us for 10 or 15 minutes and then you and I have a you know, chat. It's just, it's amazing because I never, never in my life heard of this, you know, parallel between uh, driving in the fog and and what I do, I, I never heard of that. You know? And it's amazing that me and the, the that writer had the same feeling. And uh, where are you, Bhakti? We lost Bhakti. Oh, we no. lost Bhakti. <laughs> No, no, it's just amazing. I just want to say it's how amazing it was that I never heard of this. We have a saying in Arabic. We say, the, uh, you know, because we have some Arab poems that where the verse, it's the exact same as the verse that was said before it, but mm. the poet never heard of that other poet. Yeah. And we say, poet, poet follows poet like a horse hoof. And uh, and uh, yeah. So and uh, back to your back. I just want to say how much I appreciate Larry. I think I think having Larry in this mm -hmm. world makes this world a better place. That's what yeah. I think. <laughs> That's lovely. Thanks yes. so much, Larry. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank, thanks for yeah. joining us. Uh, and wonderful. Have a great conversation. Bye. Yeah. You too. All right, Mohamedou, now I have you with uh, some very difficult questions. No, I'm just joking, not at all. Um, so I just wanted to I just wanted to kind of trace back the beginning of this uh, book a little bit, try to understand your personality as a writer, you know. So your education and your work is, uh, I think it's electrical engineering, right? That's what you went to, that's what you studied. Um, and then, yeah. thanks, right? Uh, so thanks to abhorrent circumstances, uh, you were put on the front lines of the war on terror and held without charge in Guantanamo for 15 years. And, uh, you know, I think one might imagine that your memoir, Guantanamo, was a kind of, you know, one time literary project. You did that. You had something extremely urgent you needed to say you know, to get out, out there into the world, to expose a really terrible system. Uh, and then, uh, 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 you know, but here we are, and now you have your uh, published this, this stunning, beautiful, captivating novel. And, uh, and, you know, I have no doubt that there is more novels in you, more literary works. And I don't want to say that your entire life was determined by your time in Guantanamo, but, do you think your literary persona, your writer persona developed, came out because of that experience? Uh, otherwise you would have just been an engineer and we would have never read your beautiful writing. First, Bhakti, thank you so much. You know, this is like, you know, 
you know, just think about when you write an article or an essay, and when you're very emotional, very upset. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be very different than when you write it and you don't know what to say, think, plotting, you know, because, you know, I think good, like, literary work is born out of misery and very, like, traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Because I think like we need to get to the soul. It's to come from the soul. And we need to dig deep and peel off the layer of society. And I give example that everybody understands. Just think about writing and you are censored, you know. And then writing when you are not censored. So there are there is two books in the Arab world that very known. The Al Khubz Al Havi, Bread Without Butter. I think it was written in French or in uh, Spanish first. It was written by Moroccan. It's uh, biography, mm -hmm. autobiography. Al Khubz Al Havi, Bread Without Butter, and the migration, the the season, uh, migration season to the north. Yeah. Tayyib Saleh. Mm -hmm. You know. You see, you know, that's like the, 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 the layer, the, the, the taboos that were mentioned that everybody could relate to are very important, you know, because you could write a polite novel, but who is going to relate to, to a polite novel? You know? And I wish mm -hmm. I had like the courage of a, a bread without butter and, uh, and, uh, and because it was very extreme. Like, mm -hmm. it's very close to uh, Kitchen the Rye, but Kitchen the Rye, it's fiction. Right. But it's much, much more graphic than Kitchen the Rye. And in this part of the world, this is like, he had really very miserable life. He was like sexually uh, assaulted, abused. abused, and he was working in very, very bad circumstances he, li he lived uh, in the street he had no house mm -hmm. his father was very abusive and uh, so those are the kinds of circumstances he was like working as a as slave to a into a spanish family and he mm -hmm. is describing the normal thing that is people people usually don't say about themselves so right. all i think is that of course Everything I saw in prison, everything I experienced, you know, forcibly is going to be put down in my writing somehow. Right. Mm -hmm. So could we say, could we interpret, you know, you just joined us uh, for the Intimate Book Club part before and we had a lot of people had all kinds of questions for you. Uh, and, you know, in the kind of as someone who does who's a literary critic who who you know writes about books can we say that the your character ahmed in the in the novel is trapped in the fragility of his body everything is out of his control uh, he's in tremendous pain he's all he you know he almost dies uh, and you know every chapter will begin with these very vivid nightmares and eventually, which are indicative of the trauma and the stress he's under as he goes, as he's on this journey. He can't get out, he can't get away. Um, there are a lot of elements of horror uh, actually in this novel while there being extreme beauty and silence. Um, so I think people who have read Guantanamo Diary might see this as another approach to express the violence you endured in Guantanamo. Uh, was that something that intentionally happened or as you're saying, there's no way not to express that? I think, you know, I have a saying, very philosophical saying, uh, subconscious a bit. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> subconscious no. is a bitch, okay. Yes. 
and uh, <laughs> of course you, you are smart and you 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 already got the point so one time you know in jordanian prison that was like the beginning of my nightmare some of the most horrific nightmare when you are in a very dark cell no one knows where you are if your family doesn't know where you are you can be killed you can be abused you can be tortured you can be disappeared absolute under the absolute mercy of people who don't who don't plan to use or to and i couldn't tell the difference between dreams and la and wakefulness right you know the dreams were so vivid that in my dream i i i, I when i see my family in my dream i discuss the dream with in the dream so i told i i remember this vivid dream when i telling my sister this is a dream i i'm tired of those dreams because every time i see this dream i am holding you i wake up in this very horrific dark place she said no she would say no it's not a dream hold me hold me and i would hold her mm-hmm. and then in one time i woke up in the dream holding a fake hands and cry and that's how vivid the dream because i couldn't anymore tell the whether mm-hmm. i was awake or not right right um and this is uh, actually you know people who uh uh prison literature which is kind of a long tradition it's it's not a tradition like a happy tradition but it's there's a long canon of literature that comes out of detention in prisons and uh one of the most uh, you know one of the observations that are often made is very much this this idea this idea of uh, not knowing the difference between dream and wakefulness and i think this story captures it really well even though you know his goals are different his journey ahmed's journey is uh, of course very different uh, and in the end there is a sense that ahmed does know his way he feels he's always oriented he knows how to survive the desert he can communicate beautifully uh with the camel um so you know it must be it must have been interesting for you to be in control of this story as opposed to the lack of control do you see what i'm saying could you please repeat the last part again i couldn't hear yeah sorry uh no i said i was saying that you know part of prison literature is often ab- about kind of not knowing the difference between wakefulness and sleep uh and all of these are expressions of having no control over your circumstances not knowing what's about to happen but that's not the case with ahmed uh he is a very he's very smart he understands the desert he understands the direction he knows how to read all the signs um you know he has really all the tools for survival and he can also communicate fluently with his camel lamesh so you know i wondered if you felt a sense of control while writing this fiction you know if you felt like you know now i can i can control the events here that there was something like a catharsis like a release for you some kind of freedom in writing a book like that uh i think so you know mm-hmm. like you know when we are in traumatic situation we start to romanticize uh other options of life mm-hmm. you know bedouin life is not easy it's very harsh it's very like very demanding and it's a lot of work you cannot call mm-hmm. in sick and then leave your camel alone there is no calling in sick and the working hours are very very long and very taxing you know but you know the i just you know we tend to say i tend to say okay maybe if i was a bedouin how how would it look like mm-hmm. i almost know the answer but i want to uh, uh, you know like you say you said like having some control being in the same situation but with the exception that i'm in control right 
that's that's amazing and i think you said somewhere that it was just so liberating to write fiction and you just uh you know that you enjoyed it so much that you were kind of free from reality and i love that comment <laughs> i love that comment i think you said it for the interview for uh, brittle paper uh and and it makes sense one of the other things uh i read in that same interview that you gave uh you said uh, you know and then larry was talking about it as well that this was one of the manuscripts you wrote while in detention one of the one of the four manuscripts uh, you wrote but this is the only one you got back whereas the others you know uh, they are kind of lost to to the system uh, they've been uh, you know confiscated so you know so when i read it i kept kept thinking about that and i felt maybe this is a very nostalgic uh this is a nostalgic story this is a story of nostalgia of trying to recuperate through writing this feeling of the desert your childhood uh you know a kind of uh, your, your memories would i be right to say that that uh, that in a way you were you know staying in touch with that part of you yes absolutely mm -hmm. no it's a nost and reconnecting with my uh, with my roots in a way mm -hmm. even though like I enjoy like where I am and mm -hmm. I enjoy uh, what uh, civilized life is giving me the comfort I can sleep until 10 a.m. I don't have to wake up like 5 a.m. Like, like as a Bedouin you know and uh, but just reconnecting like uh, to this life and trying to appreciate that beauty you know mm -hmm. those ingredients yeah yeah um you know uh, one of the one of the things when i was reading it that it felt to me like a comment you know we talk a lot about global warming and climate change and this book is really about the environment and the geography and about a time where uh, human beings were really connected to nature and to animals. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it felt very idealistic, very beautiful. And I'm sure there are still communities that live like that, you know, that are kind of untouched um, by, you know, colonial modern forces and things like that. Uh, but to, to me, it felt like a very sharp kind of comment on how our relationship with nature and animals has been kind of destroyed uh, how we've been, um, you know, uh, that this is a problem. So is this something you're reminding us? You know, do you think that uh, we are suffering because uh, we are not taking seriously our connection to nature, to animals, to, to the kind of natural world? Is there some, are you offering us some criticism? Not consciously, not consciously because Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really believe in the saying of uh, of Montaigne. Uh, 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 je raconte, je, je raconte, je n'enseigne pas, je n'enseigne pas, je raconte. Yeah. I don't teach, I recount. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, and we haven't been nice to our to the earth. That's very obvious. And. Uh, and we have in like whenever there is like this modern civilization people you know don't like use the resources with uh, with respect like mm -hmm. it's a very big sin in bedouin life to throw away food you know which you mm -hmm. have only to do as much food as you need and uh, water like very with very little of water you can do so much you can keep your hygiene you can eat, you can, very little of water. And now we just go under the shower and just, <laughs> just turn it off and then you need so much water you really don't need, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm well, aware of that and a Bedouin would be very aware of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, well, once you experience the joy of the shower, it's very hard to come back to uh, <laughs> what, what you're saying. But there is a feeling uh, that there is a vision in there that's very provocative, that's very uh, interesting. And even if you don't want to teach, I think there is a lesson, you know, that we're all learning, uh, learning through it. So, uh, you know, and it feels like 
these kind of modern encounters are coming with a very heavy price in the book um you know ahmed uh, you know ahmed knows about the presence of the french he knows uh you know that the that the french way has been has been rejected um you know could you talk a little bit about the time that your novel is set in you know i don't know exactly the time but i know it's like because i want to make it like timeless but i uh, because of the ingredients of the narrative mm -hmm. there is no escaping time frame so mm -hmm. i just put it between the uh, one the colonial france took over the country uh, mm -hmm. until like just during the colonial time, which is like not very long like i don't think even it's 100 years you know i just right. would say like mid 19th century or to mm -hmm. mid 20th century and okay. uh, because mauritania was not like taken uh, uh, per se it was just like because it was a the transit zone between morocco mm -hmm. and senegal and that's yeah. why it was taken so and uh, yeah it was like during this confusing time for a bedouin mm -hmm. you know they brought the cars they start to build cities uh, in mauritania mm -hmm. and it was not known as mauritania and uh, and uh, yeah it was just confusing even a camel if a camel sees a car the camel gets very confused and very irritated yeah yeah why is the camel blue and then when uh, you know is that a way is that is that just how camels are described zarga is blue and very magical in the beginning but then later when ahmed finds her uh she's not blue uh, why does why this color so blue i think is very rare in camels and blue is as described you know with a with just like some whiteness in the eye and then oh. some you know and then some whiteness a little spot white spot mm -hmm. here in the camel so blue is not a color it's mm -hmm. that's how they describe it they just say blue because of those white spot right including in the eye that sprinkle the camel mm -hmm. it's not completely white and it's not completely dark sprinkled right. with this white spot that's the definition of blue in camel world okay that's cool <laughs> um uh, i apparently the you said the book is influenced by uh some things that happened to your own father uh and you know that felt stressful once i read the book because i know there's an encounter with cannibals um is this is this are these true stories are they kind of folklore no the story with my father was true so and i confirmed that story from my sister all the sister and from my aunt mm -hmm. and uh, but the story is a little bit exaggerated in the book and i really don't know looking back i'm tempted to think that they weren't really cannibals but he just didn't know them and the way they looked the way they acted made him really very uh, scared and then he had to bail out and uh, i think he genuinely thought they were cannibals but i don't think they were cannibals okay that's good to know <laughs> because it's it paints moroccans in a very bad light if they are actually doing <laughs> if they are actually sitting around doing this in the in the desert um yeah. but that's interesting but at least they they were kind of interested in some some brutality you know they were violent at least yes yes right <laughs> yes absolutely okay uh we have a question here uh from michael uh, uh gitanjali who's helping us uh, she can beam it up so he says the book ends with ahmed in an ambivalent and a fraught space everyone thinks he's a hero and has his own version of his own vindication except ahmed who doesn't quite feel it can you explain this ending 
And are you writing the next chapter of this? Uh, yes, sir. You're right, Michael. Thank you for the question, Michael. My good friend and brother. Oh. <laughs> Why people dissect everything? Why don't you just read it and enjoy it? Uh, it's fun to dissect. That's my job. <laughs> so we say, you know, we say in, uh, in Mauritania, we have a saying, if you criticize a poem, why don't you make your own poem? And mm -hmm. the, but the answer of a uh, poem critique in Mauritania, I am criticizing your poem and I'm not offering anything instead. And uh, mm -hmm. so I think, you know, like, just, you know, like Michael, you used to uh, report about war. And when you come back, your family and people who love you, they see you as a hero because wh what you went through is very traumatic. It's very harsh. But you said, that's normal in your head because, you know, you need to be away from something in order to judge it. Ahmed couldn't be away, so you need to use a mirror to see your face. You cannot see your face. So mm -hmm. Ahmed needs the mirror and the mirror showed him something he didn't, that was not his perception about himself, you know? And I think this happens very often to people, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, until we get more questions, I have more, more questions. Uh, we have a little more time. Uh, this is also a story of faith in a way, you know? Ahmed is very, uh, very true to his God. Uh, he prays, you know, he, he's a real, he's a, you know, he's a real believer. Um, and, you know, that's, he kind of draws all his kind of intelligence from that place. And, you know, that's his kind of, that's what allows him to survive. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about faith, about religion and, you know, your relationship um, to this and what you're trying to say through Ahmed about faith? You know, I think that faith and belief are as unique to everyone as their own DNA. Uh, mm -hmm. Everyone is a walking religion. Every single person and every person, single person. Uh, when I say religion, I mean not in the traditional way, but I mean the, what people refer to as system of belief, you know, because well, let's say like the nature of God, everyone understands the nature of God in his or her own way. And uh, Ahmed is the embodiment of so many religions, so many beliefs that lived in this uh, environment and every belief, every system left its own DNA print. Mm -hmm. And you can see that, you can see ingredient of uh, Islam, ingredient of animism, you can see ingredient right. of, uh, of uh, very, he's very, he's very con content in his own skin. And he doesn't mm -hmm. see any contradiction in his beliefs. And he also regards his belief as the very true belief that mm -hmm. beyond approach beyond discussion or anything, just like yes. anyone else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, I think, um, I think, you know, I, you know, to me, this was a very unique book. It reminds me of certain other, other books. It reminds me of this book from, um, from Guinea. Uh, um, by Kamara Lay, which is called, you know, an African child or something like that. And it was a, it was a different time, a rural time uh, where a little boy is growing up before colonial times come and everything changes and there are cities and so on. Uh, but, you know, I know that you don't have the typical writer's trajectory, you know, where you decided you want to be a writer and then you read certain books and you went to certain classes. 
but I still know that you have a wide range of influences uh, to your writing, to your thinking. Uh, so books, films, what comes to mind as your inspiration for this book? You know, my biggest inspiration, mm -hmm. you know, one of my biggest inspiration was Thousand and One Night. You know, mm -hmm. like a classic. I love it. Yep. And, uh, you know, and uh, also my father was very big inspiration to me because my father died very upset and mm -hmm. very confused because he lost his camel. He had to live through the the loss of his camel herd and the loss of his livelihood and his way of life. He was the last the last generation of my forefather who mm -hmm. forcefully who was to abandon his lifestyle. And he didn't mm -hmm. like it. Wow. Uh, any other books coming to mind? We have some intruders here. Uh, hi, intruder. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, so kind yeah, of the, have, oh, yeah yeah go ahead yeah I, I really want to uh to finish this uh this uh you know this uh sequel to guantanamo bay and you saw one one uh, uh the you know one story the guard duty that was published in evergreen yeah and uh, so that's that is part of some sequel to Guantanamo because many people ask me what happened after you finish yeah. the writing of Guantanamo Diary. And mm -hmm. I also want to finish the other works, Ahmed mm -hmm. in Germany, mm -hmm. highlighting the year. The same the, Ahmed will be in Germany? Just Ahmed, no, just a different and Ahmed. Ahmed. Okay, and Ahmed. All right. Like the and then and then okay. uh, I'm doing some uh, theater work, hopefully, uh, projects mm -hmm. in Europe. Okay. And I could travel. And mm -hmm. You will always hear from me. I will always, I will always, uh, I will always uh, crush the party of uh, writers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good. And then what about film? Theater, you're saying, do you feel an interest after your book was made into a film? Do you feel an interest in writing screenplay or, you know, maybe shooting a film yourself? I mean, so Ahmed Unzarge will be adapted to a movie, to a screenplay. So. Oh, really? And uh, Okay. Yeah. Yes. And I'm very happy, very excited about it. I will be seeing so many camels. So many like dunes. <laughs> yeah. Really well, it'll be beautiful without a doubt. This is a plan or this is something that's happening for sure? It is happening. Okay. That's great. That's it. I will let you know more. Mm -hmm. And then the next book you're working on is a, is a second book that is uh, what happened after Guantanamo? Yes. Okay. No, not after Guantanamo, including after Guantanamo. Okay. Yes, uh, I finished uh, Guantanamo Diary. Okay, that's great. Um, before I was asking you what, you know, um, I guess I was asking you what other books other than Sherazade and stuff like that, that uh, you, uh, you were, uh, you know, 1001 Nights that were influencing you. Uh, and then I also want to, uh, uh, you know, I also want to ask you about, you know, if there is if there is a vibrant kind of Mauritanian literature, you know, uh, is it primarily oral or are there a lot of writers and what languages are they writing in? Anything you can tell us about the literary scene in Mauritania? Yes. So. To your knowledge, Mauritania is nicknamed the land of a million poets. Wow. Mauritania um, was only one million people. Mauritania mm -hmm. now is about four million, the population of four million. So 
Mauritania was named the country of one million poet. And uh, mm -hmm. mostly you're right, mostly it's like oral. People just like to, uh, we don't say we write a poem, we say, we say a poem. Mm -hmm. The very language of, uh, of it already reveals. And yeah. uh, it's very, very much vibrant. Unfortunately, people don't write a lot. I don't know, too lazy. Mm -hmm. And I'm so afraid that it comes a point where we lose so much of the treasure, you know? Yeah. We, because old people die and the younger mm -hmm. generation not rely, rely on memory as the old generation right. did because All life. You don't lie on it because you have a smartphone, you know? A smartphone yeah. remembers everything for you. <laughs> I know. Uh, so before when we started, uh, we started first with Larry, because uh, you were running a few minutes late, but we had planned on you reading a passage from the book. Do you still have the book in front of you? Would you like to read? Yes. Would you like to end our, our conversation by, by, by reading? Yes. Okay. The best way to fight evil spirits is to deprive them of the kind of envi environment where they strive. Sleepwalking or sleep riding makes a man vulnerable to his enemy's attack. So Ahmed decided to call it a night. Looking at the constantly located the pole star and a dub al-kabir, the big bear. They indicated it was around three hours until morning prayer time. Enough to give him a decent rest. Ahmed was looking for anything in his vast and wide desert, desert that could be called a campsite. It is next to impossible to find a shelter in the middle of nowhere, and that was where he was. He spotted a shrub a titaric standing majestically on the side of a smooth, smooth dune. Its long bare roots had been exposed by the sustained wind, but it had not been filled. Ahmed had used this titaric for many things. Camels eat the smooth, leafless wood, which both fatten them and decrease their men. Ahmed himself would eat the branches, fly. The urine in all parts and ground the seeds and mix them with oil to use as an eye lotion. Beside this multi Tariq Ahmed found a home for the night. He didn't remove the saddle because he didn't plan to stay to stay longer than necessary. He tied Lamesh four legs together to make sure he would not go too far. The animal wanted to eat since he hadn't had a chance during the long ride that day and needed a late night meal to fuel up for the journey in the morning. And I trust Amish fully, but a lone camel can want Look the scent of a camel urine, which they can smell as far as a two days ride away. Tying his camel's feet was not something Ahmed took lightly, but it was necessary. He wrapped the other end of the camel's tether around the top of the saddle, leaving it loose enough for the animal to move his neck freely and get to the hard to read spots on the tether. Thank you so much for reading my book. <laughs> Hi. I'm still here. Yes. Thanks, Mohamedou. Uh That was a, that was that was lovely. Thank you so much. We should have started with it, which would have put us in the mood. But now uh, it'll put people in the mood to buy the book and see what uh, happens uh, in the actual true story of Ahmed and Zarga. Thank you for joining us today, and congratulations on this fantastic book. Cheers! I just have water. <laughs> Is that tea? I don't know what you're drinking. 
Um, and hopefully there's no, yes. hopefully this, everyone can do this together in a party somewhere, somehow. But for now. Thank you so much. Love you guys. Thanks so much. You can buy the book on Ohio University Press. And uh, the actual true story of Ahmed and Zarga is, has recently been published. So go and get it. Thanks so much.